50,000 people used to live here. Now it's a ghost town. Sorry, but could it really be a Call of Duty 4 video essay without including that quote? You guys really enjoyed the Modern Warfare 2 video that I posted a little while ago, and it was heavily requested that I make a video about Modern Warfare 3 next. Well, I decided to ignore those requests completely, and instead today I'm going to be covering the first and perhaps the most interesting speed game in the Modern Warfare series, Call of Duty 4. For this game I challenged myself to see what kind of time I could get in a week with no prior experience. In fact, this would actually be my first time ever playing a first person shooter with mouse and keyboard. So I'll be covering a bunch of the strats I used, as well as those used by top runners, and maybe even some individual level strats. I really hope you all enjoy. What makes COD 4 unique compared to its other Modern Warfare counterparts is that there's speed tech exclusive to this game that isn't in the others. The main tech used in speedruns are strafing, elevators, and bounces. Before the days of Modern Warfare 2 speedrunning, strafing was already an established movement tech in COD 4. It's exactly the same in both games, allowing a player to achieve speeds faster than sprinting. This is a very nuanced mechanic, and it works by first sprinting, and then jumping in the direction you want to go, while moving your mouse in the same direction. So if you want to do a left strafe, you would hold W and A, and glide your mouse to the left. In order to get high speeds with it, it's less about doing everything as quickly as you could possibly input it, and requires a bit more finesse, picking the perfect mouse sensitivity and speed while keeping a good rhythm. Since I was only playing this game for a week, I could only consistently get velocity speeds in the 330s to 370s, which was even a bit higher than what was expected from me in such a short time frame. But from speedrunners who have played these games consistently for over a year have essentially perfected the mechanic, and can get speeds as high as 400 units. The main trick to getting faster strafes is never letting go of the directional keys during the entire movement and having the mouse always moving to continue building velocity. It might look annoying when you see it in runs, but considering the normal max run speed is 285, Having a 30% higher movement speed is quite significant, and some strats are only possible by using them, but we'll get to that in a little bit. The next movement tech called elevators are a way for a player to confuse a game by making it think that a player is able to stand and not stand under an object at the same time. Let's take this tree for example. Under normal circumstances, if you're crouched under any part of this tree, you won't be able to stand. But if you position yourself one unit out from the point of not being able to stand, you'll be elevated on top of it. As you can probably guess, this allows for players to skip large portions of missions by accessing boundaries that are otherwise not possible. And then the last movement tech bounces are sort of similar to elevators, in the sense that you can gain a lot of height in order to reach certain boundaries. When jumping from a high plane such as a building with a lot of velocity and hitting a slanted surface, such as the hood of a car, the game converts that into upwards velocity. This tech alone is what cracked Call of Duty 4 speedrunning wide open, which I'll be covering more later. But for now, let's go ahead and get started with the run. We start our journey in the mission FNG, playing as Soap. Before Soap became the badass he was in Modern Warfare 2, he was introduced to Captain Price by fellow Special Air Service member Gaz, and was dubbed the fucking new guy. Being the first mission of the game, it's pretty much just a tutorial on how to shoot a million different ways. The only real time saves in this beginning section are pressing escape when prompted to reverse your controls, and shooting the hipfire targets quickly. This is why most runners opt for going prone and sitting in the corner, which makes the crosshair smaller, improving hipfire accuracy. Everything else in this section is pretty much capped by dialogue. After the tutorial, we'll head over to the training course and pick up the MP5 and 4 flashbangs. Ideally, we'll complete the training course in about 15 seconds and then run over to Price and the others. On screen, you can see the individual level world record by Lizard and see some of the tricks that they use to save time, such as throwing flashbangs behind the targets to avoid being blinded. But even with the most ideal circumstances, perfect strafes, and playing the game with French dialogue to save time, they get a time of 2 minutes and 14.45 seconds. And the fastest time I, an absolute noob at this game got, was a low 218, so there are only a handful of seconds to save on this level. After the difficulty screen appears, we'll select Recruit, as that's what we play on for any percent speedruns. The course we complete in the FNG is based off the cargo ship in the next level crew expendable, to prepare soap for the mission. This mission takes place at night, on an Estonian freighter in the Bering Strait. The mission is to recover a suspected nuclear device, which is hidden in a crate inside one of the ship's cargo holds. Once we're on the deck, we need to kill all four guys inside this room as quickly as possible. After running downstairs, we'll bump into this drunk guy, and we'll need to take him out because not killing him can cause a soft lock later on. There will be two enemies that spawn on the catwalk ahead, and we'll take them out since they drop an AK-47. In this beginning portion of the level, there's very little we can do to save any time, as we're just waiting on our teammates. The AK-47 is one of the best guns in the game, and is only held back by its slow run speed. On Recruit, it takes out most enemies with a single bullet, 
So while waiting, we'll take out these enemies so that they don't slow down our teammates. Eventually, a helicopter will come down and shoot out the windows. Afterwards, we'll enter the cargo ship. But again, we're pretty much gated by teammates. And nothing really matters until we reach this closed door, which is really when the level officially starts. After heading through the door, we'll switch to the AK and kill the three enemies on the far catwalk. Past this open doorway will be the final area, and every enemy has to be killed in order to advance. Weirdly enough, this section is probably my least favorite in the speedrun, for the only reason that I'm really bad at it, which is why I'll be showing you how other runners handle it instead. Some runners do this in a counterclockwise rotation from front to back, and others do the exact opposite, and some also use flash grenades. It's really all about what works for you. This area can be a little tricky, because there are times where enemies hide behind certain objects, and if you're not paying attention, it's really easy to lose track of them. We'll know the area is cleared when we hear the dialogue, Tango Down. The main reason for me showing other runners completing this is because if you complete it quickly enough and get good RNG, Gaz will actually teleport straight to the container, saving a few seconds. Unfortunately, I never got this warp once, and if I ever do any more runs of this game, this would for sure be where I spend most of my time practicing. After opening up the container, we discover it contains a huge amount of plutonium. However, we receive word that there won't be enough time to secure it, so we just grab the shipping manifest instead. Sprinting is disabled during the escape. However, we're still able to perform strafe jumps and wall run to move a bit faster. Wall running is sort of like an easier version of strafing. By holding W and then either A or D into a wall with a good camera angle can allow for speeds up to 235 while walking forwards. From here, all we have to do is make it to the helicopter and the mission is complete. The shipping manifest that Soap grabs points to the Middle Eastern military and their leader Al-Assad as the intended buyer of the nuclear device. All right, so it's time for the hardest mission of the game. The coup. As we load into the mission, we save and quit. Then on the mission select screen, we select Act 1 and go straight to Blackout, skipping the mission completely. Yeah, similar to No Russian to Modern Warfare 2, this is just an auto-scroller mission. But even worse, as there's no actual gameplay. There's 4 minutes and 44 seconds of cinematic, and nothing else. The timing rules still include this entire mission as part of the final time, so whether you skip it or not, it will be added onto the final speedrun time. The mission itself introduces the primary antagonists of this game, which are Al-Assad and the father-son duo Imran and Viktor Zakaev. The president of Saudi Arabia, Al-Fulani, was captured by Al-Assad and his military forces. He's driven through the city, sees Al-Assad forces rounding up and executing people, which are most likely supporters of Al-Fulani. At the end of the mission, Al-Fulani is executed by Al-Assad with the Desert Eagle after saying the words, this is how it begins in Arabic, to a camera. But before we get to my favorite mission of the game, I'd like to give a special thanks to today's video sponsor, Enlisted. Enlisted is a World War II era first person shooter and is really unique in design as compared to something like Call of Duty, which is either PvP or player versus environment, it's both at the same time, as in this game, you get to command your own squad of AI players to fight against your real opponents. There's also a whole separate campaign mode starting in 1941 to 1945, following the historical timeline the whole way through, which looks really fun as well. Graphically, this game looks amazing. The gameplay is a good balance of being fast paced and strategic, while not being so super hardcore that it's impossible for new players to get into. Enlisted is available for free with cross platform compatibility on PC, Xbox Series X and S, and PlayStation 5, and even on previous console generations as well. And by using my link in the description, you'll get a free bonus starter pack to begin your adventure. Thanks again to Enlisted for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to the speedrun. Next up, we are on to my personal favorite mission, Blackout. The Special Air Service learns that their informant, Nikolai, has been taken prisoner by the Ultranationalists. Because of this, Price leads a rescue mission to retrieve him. Immediately at the start of the mission, we'll switch the M4A1 to grenade launcher mode, as for some reason assault rifles like the M4A1 and AK-47 restrict us to roughly 257 speed units, but with a grenade launcher out, we can reach the max speed of 285. In the beginning part of the mission, speed really matters, so I'll prioritize getting good strafes, go around the right side of this little island to avoid detection from the enemies, and then shoot straight for the rightmost arch of this bridge. I want to shoot the grenade launcher as soon as possible once I'm in range of the enemies to aggro them, and assuming I have enough distance between Soap, Price, and Gaz, they should warp over here, saving quite a bit of time. After killing the remaining enemies, we're now just waiting for Price to reach the house to open up the door. To speed this up, we can throw grenades behind Price to make him run faster, which can pretty much be done anytime Price is in the stealth mode, and saves about a second and a half per grenade throw. Personally, I only go for one or two grenade throws when Price is going uphill, 
because failing to strat means that price will run in the opposite direction and hide, losing at least 5 seconds. So it can be quite the tricky maneuver, and is much more difficult than it looks. After Price opens a door, we'll make our way to this gap in the white fence and take out the enemies on the ground. By using a precise lineup, it's possible to chuck a C4 all the way into this house. This is really beneficial, as it gives us more time to set up for two elevators on this burning building. Normally we'd just be waiting around here until Kamarov opens up the door, but it's actually possible to get into this house early. I'll do this by running into this window frame until I can't move any further. Go prone, and then position my crosshair aligned with a specific texture. Once I'm positioned, I'll use my arrow keys which are binded to do really small movements, and I'll tap the right one twice to place me under the window. The texture you use here really doesn't matter that much, but the purpose of the camera angle is so that when we run forward, we run into the wall slightly left to get a speed of around 0.4 or under, which will shoot us up on top of the window. There are a couple different ways to do this, but I like this method the most. After getting on top of the window, we have to jump and then crouch immediately after to elevate her straight to the top of the house, to which we can then jump inside until the enemies in the house spawn and then we can see for them. While waiting around we can head outside of the house, but can't go too far otherwise the game will softlock. While waiting we can shoot enemies as they run out onto this grassy area, and we'll need to kill a couple of them to speed up the next section. Once we hear the dialogue, sir we've got company, that's our cue to strafe to the top of this hill and kill the enemies that spawn out of the helicopter. Another benefit to doing the elevators into the house makes it so less enemies spawn from the helicopters for some reason, meaning we can take them out super quickly, and since we already took out a couple enemies on the grass from earlier, the three enemies that spawn in this house come out much quicker, and they can be taken out immediately. So just by hitting those elevators makes this whole area flow so much better, which is why I love this level so much. Afterwards we'll make our way to the top of the hill and through the electrical area to begin our rappel to the bottom area. Once we hit the ground, we'll run and gun some more enemies and head towards the house where Nikolai is. The faster these enemies are taken out, the better. When Price says, bloody hell, let's move. If we have any leftover C4 from the previous window shenanigans, we can throw them through the windows in the house in order to take out a few enemies early and make this section a bit easier. But it doesn't save any time, so prioritizing the earlier C4 strat is much more important. As we make our way up the stairs and enter Nikolai's room, Price and Nikolai will start talking to each other and the extract helicopter will soon appear and then we'll head over to it after it lands and complete the mission. With Nikolai secure and the village in control of the Russian loyalists, the team heads for a German safe house. Now it's time for one of the trickiest missions in the entire game, Charlie Don't Serve. In this mission we play as USMC Sergeant Paul Jackson. He and the first Force Recon Marines are involved in a raid against an Arabian coastal town with the hopes of being able to capture Al-Assad. This mission has a hardest skip in the game, saving a bit over 3 minutes if performed quickly. Again, this is the most difficult trick in the game, and I opted out for using it in a week-long challenge. And I'll explain it in a moment, but first let me go over how the levels play normally. We start out by dropping down from the helicopter and running straight to the first breach. After the door is unlocked, we can just strafe jump through the building quickly to avoid enemies blocking doors, and take out the last two enemies with the pistol and pick up the AK-47. By just chilling on the staircase, we'll complete the objective, which will despawn all of the enemies. Now we could just head straight for the next breach, but instead I like to wait until Vasquez physically leaves the building, and once I see him start running, that's when I leave to ensure he runs all the way to the next breach. Then for the next breach, we just need to take out all of the enemies as quickly as possible, and once the last enemy dies, that's pretty much all there is as far as the speedrun is concerned, just a bunch of waiting after the fact. But there is a way to skip both of these breaches. At the beginning of the level, top speedrunners will run straight over this car and perform a mantle to get on top of this little peg sticking out and jump on top of the roof. From here they'll need to get a good speed strafe to hit the top of this car to bounce over the barrier, skipping the first breach entirely. There's also an elevator you can do instead, which you can see the world record holder Who's do to achieve the same effect. The problem here is once you do this skip, you're essentially softlocked, as Vasquez will never do the first breach and therefore never run to the second one. From here speedrunners will beeline straight to the second breach area, hopping up on this building to collect an RPG along the way. Once arriving at the TV station, they'll use a texture setup on this tree to elevate or up it, going any speed at 0.07 velocity or lower, and then set up for an extremely precise bounce. To do this, they'll need an air strafe with good speed, somewhere in at least a 360 velocity ballpark, if not more. They'll aim this air strafe towards the back of this car, trying to hit the angled polygon of the windows, and then upon impact, shoot the RPG for additional height. Then they'll switch their direction to the right to redirect the momentum, and then crouch to land in the window, skipping the second breach entirely. Like I said earlier, if performed quickly, this skip saves roughly 3 minutes, but it's kind of a run killer if it can't be pulled off at all. 
If I were to do this in runs, I'd probably just do the first breach and pick up an RPG off the table and then do attempts while waiting for Vasquez to arrive. Doing it this way only saves 2 minutes, but would still be better than being softlocked. But yeah, that's pretty much all there is for this level, but the fact these skips are even possible is kind of mind blowing. In the lore there is a report that Al-Assad had taken over a local television station and was broadcasting from there. However, when the team arrived at the studio, Al-Assad was nowhere to be found, and the broadcast was simply on a loop. The battle was a loss for the Americans, with Al-Assad on the run once again. The bog is one of the most interesting missions in the entire game, simply because of the checkpoint system. Sometimes you won't receive any checkpoints when completing objectives, and any mistake can set you back a ton of time and straight up kill your run. Not that that would have ever happened to me. There are also many things that must be done in order to get Vasquez to teleport to us at a specific point in the mission, which will save a ton of time. You could probably make an entire video just on this mission alone, but I'll just show you guys how I do it. Playing as Sergeant Jackson once again, we're tasked with fighting through enemy lines to reach and protect a disabled M1A2 tank. I'll start at this level running straight to this car, and then wait a bit until I hear the marine say clear, because if I run forward too quickly, I'll just get insta-killed. I'll then make my way to the staircase and wait till I hear Vasquez say building, and then run downstairs and chill at the spot. While waiting here I'll be keeping my eyes on the minimap, watching my teammates movements until I see two of them walk down the staircase. This makes it so when I run into the building, my teammates will get warped inside, allowing the later dialogue to progress sooner. I'll then take out this group of enemies with the grenade launcher, finish off the remaining enemies in this room, and pick up an AK-47. I'll then begin taking out all of the enemies on the other side of the building with the AK, until Vasquez commands me to use the shotgun. Upon hearing this dialogue, an enemy will spawn behind the wall, and I'll want to take him out and continue shooting until I hear Vasquez say, good job. I'll head towards this door and reload my ammo along the way. There are two things we want to achieve here, spawning the enemies on the overpass, and spawning Private West. I'll primarily focus on Vasquez moving up to this concrete barrier while trying to eliminate all enemies on the street. Any cars that are on fire during this section need to be manually exploded, or else Vasquez will wait for them to explode, which loses time. But yeah, for the most part this area is just clearing out enemies as quickly as possible. We'll wait for Private West to run out and die, and if he doesn't die right away, we can just intentionally kill him. We'll loot his javelin and take out two tanks while being cautious of potential RPG fire. Also, if we hit reload immediately after firing the javelins, we'll reload slightly faster than normal. After shooting in the second tank, I'll also throw a flash out towards the overpass to prevent the enemies from slowing down my teammates. Also, before I leave this area, I like to grab a G3, which is arguably the best gun in the game. It has fast movement speed, pretty much the same damage output as the AK-47, with none of the crazy recoil. Trust me, you'll be seeing more of the G3 later on. After getting past this fence, it's the bog area. And once we get to the overpass, it's important that we wait for the Alpha 6 dialogue to start before heading in. Because if we cross too early, we could potentially softlock the game. As we run to the house on the left, we'll head inside killing all of the enemies. When the Bravo 6 dialogue starts, we can leave the house safely, kill the next three enemies, plant the C4, and then hide behind the wall to blow it up. Next we'll run to this trash bin to place the beacon. After placing the beacon, we can just chill out for a bit, taking out additional enemies as we see them, and then once everything is cleared out, we'll head towards the tank. By going prone near this barrel, staring at this hole, and keeping the line on the compass exactly where I have it placed will cause our allies to teleport straight to the tank. And since we're already so close to the tank, we immediately hit the trigger to finish the level. The squad regroups and sets up a defensive perimeter, allowing the engineers to come in and repair the damaged tank. Next up is Hunted, which picks up where the mission Blackout left off at. It's a pretty linear mission similar to Crew Expendable, with most of it relying on your teammates to move from point A to point B. On the way to the German safe house to drop off Nikolai, a Stinger missile hits the team's helicopter. Captain Price's team are then forced to make their way to safety through fields and shacks in order to avoid the notice of an enemy helicopter sent to search for survivors. First we'll grab an MP5 and run under this bridge to avoid detection. When the helicopter spotlight passes us, we'll run to this door and wait for Price and the others to arrive. Our main goal should not be detected by enemies, as this will cause time loss in the upcoming fight. When the garage door opens up, we open fire on a group of guys that are harassing this farmer, and once the last guy is dead, we'll loot their bodies for a shotgun and an AK-47. As we run far into the field, we ideally want to keep gas in front of the pack, because the order in which our allies run out determines which spots they stand in once we cross the field. We'll then shoot just one bullet at the helicopter once it's visible, intentionally getting ourselves detected to make our allies run forward. Ideally we get gas in this position near the tractor, and then we can just push them slightly closer to the basement door, saving a bit of time. We can also do a jump to get on top of the invisible wall to drop down in front of them. 
After running through the house, we just need to kill the three guys that are up the stairs, ideally killing them quickly enough to avoid getting flashbanged. Next is a big area where we'll just need to kill all the enemies quickly and move forward as quickly as possible so that Price isn't slowed down by dogs or waiting for burning cars to explode. When Price opens the fence, this is when the level truly begins. We'll move quickly towards this bridge until we see this car stop and fire a shot to alert the enemies. Next we'll run across the field until we reach this round bale and chill behind it until we see the helicopter spotlight shine towards us and then we can move back a bit. This will lure the helicopter towards us. It's important to manipulate the helicopter to fly towards this direction because any other direction can cause a soft lock. By perfectly timing and aiming a grenade throw, it's possible to blow up this helicopter in one shot, usually waiting about 3.5 ticks before tossing the grenade up. This saves a ton of time in the next section because otherwise we'd have to shoot two Stinger missiles at the helicopter, which we can only do once we're given the objective, which we only get once our allies reach the barn. But by doing this, we skip the Stinger missiles and don't have to wait for any dialogue saving a ton of time, I'd guess anywhere from 20 to 30 seconds. And yeah, I guess canonically, a grenade is officially as strong as two Stinger missiles in the Call of Duty universe. After heading out of the barn, we'll need to hit a strafe jump over this fence and quickly run across this field. If we're too slow, it's really easy to get shot before getting to this little pit where we can safely prone to avoid any further shots. After the AC-130 clears out the enemies, we can run to the end level trigger and finish the level. The next mission, Death From Above, immediately begins where Hunted left off, but this time we play as a gunner on an AC-130, and our role is to protect Captain Price and his team as they make their way through the enemy-controlled village. It's honestly just an RNG auto-scroller, and it sucks so much that it's completely skipped in the speedrun mod version of the game. But even though it does suck, and there's a lot of RNG involved, there are some strats we can do here which do save a significant amount of time. As soon as the mission begins, we'll spam the weapon swap key to skip some dialogue. Most of this mission revolves around killing a certain amount of enemies during specific times of the in-game timer, which can be seen in the bottom right. At 21 seconds is when we first get control of the guns. We have about 12 seconds to kill 7 enemies, and if done correctly, our teammates will move up at 36 seconds. Any other kills we get beyond the 7 aren't necessary, but we will want to clear out any enemies that aren't in front of the church to force more to spawn there. At 50 seconds is when the kill counter starts mattering again and we'll need to kill 5 more enemies before 1 minute and 1 second on the timer. Once I'm sure 5 enemies are killed, I'll blow up this house to make it easier to see enemies out of it later on. I'll continue killing enemies around these houses, surrounding the church until I see a car spawn on the road, and I'll take that out. Once the timer hits 1 minute 25 seconds, I'll kill 10 more enemies around these houses, and then begin firing at the house I destroyed earlier. This isn't done to actually kill any enemies, but it's done to prevent any of them from spawning early, because this house is by far the most important part about this level. I'll continue taking out more enemies while I wait for this truck to spawn. I'll take out the truck, and then pay close attention to the enemies coming out of the destroyed house. I'll need to take out every single one of these enemies, and once the last one is killed, we'll hear the audio rolling in. If you look at the level timer on the right hand side, you can see I finished the rolling in section anywhere from 38 to 48 seconds, depending on how quickly I take out the enemies. Optimally, this can be completed in as little as 36 seconds, but when I was doing runs, I take anything under a minute and 6 seconds, because that's the time you get in which the section just auto-completes itself. After this, we're mostly in the clear. However, we'll need to shoot enemies near the ambush village so that our teammates can drive out of the area faster. When they reach a junkyard, we have about 78 seconds to kill 12 enemies, so really we have plenty of time. There are also tons of enemies during this section, and we'll just have to leave some of them alive after killing 12 of them, so that we can kill exactly 5 of them after Price says, Wildfire, we've reached the LSE. We have 20 seconds to do this, so it's not too bad. After this mission is finished, we just have to wait about a minute for it to fade out. The team gets rescued by the extraction helicopters, and they make it to the German safe house. In the mission Warpig, it picks up right from where the bog left off at. The M1 tank, also known as Warpig, has been fixed by engineers, and now the squad has to push forward into the enemy territory. This level is almost entirely RNG, but there are some things we can do to speed things up. In the first couple of areas, we can just focus on strafing and ignore all enemies. After stepping inside this building, we need to face towards the very first area so that the tank can load in and move down the street. And once the level timer hits 34 seconds, we can start clearing out enemies to prevent them from slowing down our teammates. Once we have two teammates standing near the door, we can start running towards the back alley by the dumpster. When we move up, one of our allies will start to push the dumpster, and it's important to not move up too early, or else our ally will be stuck in the state, causing us to lose time. After the dumpster is moved, they'll run towards the turret building and open up the door for us. 
how quickly the friendly tank shoots down the enemy tank will come down to luck, and there isn't anything else we can do at this point to speed things up. After the tank is blown up, we can proceed to the final area, and wait around for the helicopter, and just chill out to the max, because we don't even need to enter the helicopter to finish the level. After killing all enemies and destroying an enemy tank, Vasquez and Sergeant Jackson leave to finish off Al Assad. In the mission Shock and Awe, the first three minutes are pretty much an auto scroller. Sergeant Jackson and the rest of Lieutenant Vasquez's squad joins in an attack on what they believe to be Al Assad's position. Jackson provides support with a grenade launcher aboard a transport helicopter, while the first force recon attacks Al Assad's capital city. While the first three minutes are an auto scroller, we can't just take our hands off the controller because enemy RPGs can deal a ton of damage and it doesn't take much to get us killed. Would definitely be an awkward spot to lose a run. After landing, we'll run through the area and into this building and then up the stairs, and our teammates will spawn in front of us. Then we'll make our way to the objective point and wait for the helicopter to arrive. We'll need to walk to the right side of this grass to push the objective marker up and then stand about three meters away from the marker, being no closer than two meters away. When the helicopter comes into frame, I'll wait for his texture to change and then hold up, allowing our character to just warp up inside of it, saving a bit of time. It's important that we don't do this too quickly, otherwise we'll either lose time or just softlock the level. During the next auto scroller, the USMC's primary attack helicopter is shot down, so Vasquez's squad stops to rescue the pilot. When carrying them, it's important to not immediately walk forward because you'll get stuck for some reason, so I just wait until my velocity reads zero before moving forward. You can also do sort of a wiggle walk to slightly move faster by mashing A and D, and even moving the mouse a bit to save fractions of a second. And there's even a little spot here to wall run on. Once we make it to the helicopter, the mission is pretty much over. The story here is actually a bit interesting, as this is the incident which prompted General Shepard to start the Russo-American War. While the team leaves the city, a nuclear bomb is detonated, which causes the helicopters to crash back onto the ground, killing about 30,000 US troops. The last mission of Act 1, Aftermath, is pretty short. It takes place instantly after shock and awe, where Sergeant Jackson awakens from the crash after the nuclear detonation. This level is only a minute long, and just features Sergeant Jackson crawling on the floor, but there actually are some strats here. We'll start out by moving towards the back of the helicopter, mashing crouch as quickly as we can, allowing Jackson to stand up to move a lot faster. We can also do a couple of wall runs before falling on the ground. After falling on the ground, we can mash crouch again, and then wall run, getting speeds up to about 70 velocity, which is 10 times faster than what we would normally be moving at, which saves a ton of time in this level. After finally stumbling over, the buildings begin to collapse, and our squad members such as Vasquez and Paleo are seen either dying or their dead bodies lying around the area. The mission will fade as Jackson dies, ending Act 1. In the first mission of Act 2, Safe House, Nikolai tells Captain Price and his team that Al-Assad may be hiding in a safe house located in Azerbaijan, which he has used previously. The way I do this mission is I immediately switch to my shotgun and climb up this cliff, doing a somewhat tricky jump to scale up quicker, switching into the airstrike marker during the jump because I really suck at hitting the number keys while moving. Next I'll place a marker on the cliff to our left. If timed correctly, it will change Price's pathing so that he approaches the last building from a different angle, and it also prevents a soft lock where Price can just randomly get stuck somewhere. In this next section, we pretty much just need to strafe through everything and try our best not to die. Normally to complete this mission, we have to go through each of the houses, clearing them one by one. But by touching this pipe, we'll trigger Price to run towards the final building, and more importantly, force Al-Assad to spawn inside the house that is closest to our teammates. When Price opens the door, it's the end of the mission, aside from about a minute of cutscene. The team finds Al-Assad in the building, and Price begins punching him in the face. Price then ties him to a chair for interrogation, demanding to know who gave Al-Assad the bomb. A cell phone rings and Gaz picks it up, then tosses it to Price. Price gets really mad and then turns to Al-Assad and kills him. Gaz asks who was on the phone, and Price says it was Imran Zakayev, and finds out that he is the leader of the Four Horsemen, which is a group that is seeking world domination. Aside from Imran, it includes Makarov, Al-Assad, and Imran's son, Victor. The next mission is all gillied up, which takes place 15 years before the main events of Call of Duty 4. Price, who was a lieutenant at the time, is placed under the command of Captain McMillan. The two are wearing ghillie suits, and must make their way to a hotel vantage point and wait for their target, Imran Zakayev. As the screen fades in from black, if we hold W, we can step forward early, and can actually start the mission immediately standing up, which saves maybe a full second when combined together. Just ahead of us are two guys that will need to snipe. This is actually easier said than done, because it's extremely easy to alert the group hiding in the house, plus some dogs, which will make the next section much harder to do. 
we can then head straight towards the shed and can perform an interesting trick to get on top of it. By running into this bush, aiming the pistol towards the corner of the roof, and then sprinting forward and holding jump, we can actually mantle right on top of it. This trick saves a couple of minutes as it skips some later sections and is a very easy trick to learn, so it's absolutely necessary to do. After jumping off the roof, we can travel out of bounds and follow a specific line to the next area. However, if we step out too far, we'll be hit with radiation, and this can lose a solid chunk of time. We'll be on foot for a bit, so most of the time save in this mission comes just from having good strafes, as this is the most strafe intensive portion of the speedrun. As we strafe through this junkyard, we'll avoid killing any enemies. Their aggro will be determined if we alerted anyone in the beginning of the mission. But since we didn't, or at least shouldn't have, we really shouldn't be dying here. But if we did, we can always just toss a flashbang, or do what I always do, and just YOLO it. After heading into the junkyard, we'll find this mattress sticking out and jump onto it. We'll need to do a precisely timed sprint jump to get on top of these storage containers and head towards a field where the second convoy spawns in. This skip plus a previous one saves several minutes in the speedrun and saves the most time overall. And for how much time they save, they really aren't too bad to do. There's a lot more movement until we reach the last building. However, there's one guy we can kill in order to grab his G3. This weapon will carry over into the next mission, which is super helpful, so I always grab it. And then from here, we'll just need to run into the end trigger. One shot, one kill picks up three days after the last mission, and it sees Lieutenant Price and Captain McMillan patiently waiting on the top floor of a hotel with sniper rifles waiting for Imran Zakayev to appear. We'll start out by shooting at the bottom left of the screen to skip a bit of McMillan's dialogue. While waiting for Zakayev to appear, it's important to keep an eye on the flag as that determines which way the wind will be blowing, which is completely luck based. Getting this first try is super important because if we miss, that means we have to restart the mission not only losing our G3, but also losing 40 seconds. Personally, I like to wait until Zakayev places a briefcase on the car, and then just start rapid firing once I feel I have the shot, because the wind can change mid-shot, so you might as well take as many opportunities as you can get. Once we hit the shot, a helicopter will spawn in front of us, and we'll shoot the pilot as soon as possible. Then we'll run down to the rappel, and wait until we regain control. Our next objective is to get McMillan to the apartment ahead. There are a handful of different ways to handle this, how I like to do it is to start out by throwing a C4 by this building, and then detonating it once I pass the back two tires to the buses, which will kill the dogs as they spawn, which is really nice to do because these dogs control McMillan quite a bit if not dealt with. Just ahead are two groups of enemies that we can toss C4 at, and then use a G3 to take out the rest. During this entire section, we need to pray that McMillan doesn't get stuck on anyone, or jump by a dog. Before McMillan gets to the apartments, we'll place down a claymore by this gate to spawn kill another dog, just so we can avoid dealing with it later. In the next open area, we'll take out four enemies, and then the next wave will spawn inside this building. Again, the G3 is really nice for clearing out the section. McMillan then calls an enemy helicopter and tells us to take it down, but all we really have to do is scope at it, and it doesn't take a single bullet for it to go down. McMillan eventually gets hit by the helicopter, and now we have to carry him through the next section. Again, when I have access to walls, I'll use them for wall runs, and any other time, just spam A and D to move slightly faster. After carrying him into the next set of apartments, we enter the dog section, and at this point, we need to stop spamming A and W, because even the slightest of speed increase will not allow us to walk past the dogs for some reason. Weird game. Ideally, the dogs won't chase us after leaving the building, but if they do, and we get bit three times, it's recommended to set down McMillan for a moment just to take them out, as this will lose way less time compared to a death. We'll make our way to this ferris wheel and drop off McMillan just after this yellow car and shoot two enemies nearby then we can pick him back up and drop him in the sniper spot. It's important that we do this as quickly as possible, because by dropping him before he tells you to place him down, means that the option to pick him back up will always be available. Otherwise, the option is only available after the helicopter has already landed. But for a speed run, it's much quicker to pick him up before it arrives and enter it just after it lands. After placing down McMillan, he'll give us his remaining claymores, and we'll just want to place them in a spot where an enemy can't trigger them, because we could just blow ourselves up which would be quite unfortunate. After placing all the claymores, the objective will update, we can crouch behind this wall and kill the enemies as they spawn behind the safe spot. This section is always the same in any playthrough, and we don't have to stress too much about it, because McMillan will always finish off any stray enemies that get through. He's actually pretty good at killing enemies. So after they're all dead, the enemy helicopters will spawn in. Back towards the ferris wheel, we'll plant some C4 near the cars where the first helicopter drops enemies. As enemies begin to repel from the helicopter, we can take them out with one bullet apiece from the G3. After killing the enemies from the third helicopter, we can detonate the C4. 
From here we just have to wait for Macmillan for extraction. There will be some enemies that appear in the area, so we just have to take them out, focusing more on the ones on the right side, as that's where we'll need to go when the helicopter spawns. When the time to leave says 1000 meters, that's when we pick up Macmillan and head for the helicopter. It's really important to not board it until we hear the dialogue Alpha Team. Otherwise there's a chance the door lands on us, causing a death. But if we are quick enough without dying, we can scoot past the allies, saving a bit of time. Price and Macmillan are then lifted to safety. In the mission Heat, the Special Air Service fights against Imran's decay of supporters after the capture and execution of Al-Assad. Price and company defend a hill, while a soldier named Mac provides machine gun fire. We need to kill three people before Price says, Squad, hold your ground. A crowd of enemies spawns downhill from us, and at this point we can kinda just take our time, but we still need to shoot at least four enemies, which are only counted after Gas says copy. Once enough enemies are dead, we need to set up a bunch of claymores all around the barbed wire area behind this house. This will allow for more enemies to die, which in turn causes the helicopter to spawn more and sooner, and also allows us to skip having to use a machine gun, so we can just wait in this building until the detonators spawn. After they spawn in, we can pretty much just use them in any order. I think the safest order is to use the rightmost one, and then the left two, and then come back for the last. We just need to be careful that we don't accidentally detonate a teammate. Again, not that I would ever do that. When Max dialogue begins, we run up this hill and towards the farm. Before entering the farm, I like to throw a smoke grenade slightly right of the gate to cover myself while shooting at the tanks, and then replace my light machine gun with the RPG sitting nearby. I'll then head inside the barn and grab the javelin, and I'll use this to take out the first three tanks. As I run through the field, I'll continue shooting at the tanks until I destroy the third one, and then replace the javelin with the LMG I left by the RPGs earlier. I'll then use the RPG to take out the final tank on the left. The reason I do it this way is because the RPG is slightly quicker than the javelin, but I also want to have the LMG for when running downhill so I don't risk dying from the enemies. Then I'll need to hit a trigger at the bottom of this hill near the landing zone to get the transport helicopter to spawn in as soon as possible. Then we enter it and wait for the mission to end. The team successfully evacuates Azerbaijan, except for Mac, who is presumed to have died providing fire support for the squad. In the last mission of Act 2, The Sins of the Father, Captain Price's team chases down Victor, the son of Imran Zikayev, in order to interrogate him to get closer to Imran. We first need to get in range of a guard station, and then use our sniper to kill the watchmen. The game is designed to have our movement speed increase for a bit after alerting them, so doing this as early as possible is critical. Next we'll throw all of our grenades in the direction of this diner, and pick off any stragglers with a pistol or any gun we find on the ground. After hearing the dialogue, area secure, we'll climb up this guard tower and an RPD will be given to us. When the enemy convoy arrives, we can shoot a shot as Victor's car drives in, triggering the fight early. We can snipe any enemy except for Victor, and try to find the coveted G3 somewhere on the ground so that we can pick it up after the tower falls. After Victor takes out the tower, the chase to capture him begins. We'll ideally grab a G3, and then head through these alleys using an LMG when needed for safety. Eventually we'll reach a building with a machine gun nest. If we don't have the G3, it takes 4 sniper shots and quite a few sprays of the LMG to take it down. But with the G3, you can shoot it down with less than half a clip, just to demonstrate how powerful it is. There are two different strats we can do for the next section. Either to enter the building from the left side and navigate through the building as intended, or to do an elevator on the far right side of the building. To do the elevator, we line up the crosshairs with the center of this door, we jump sideways to hit the top portion of the wall, and then after pressing the arrow key up 7 times, down once, and then crouch, then jump, we'll elevator to the top of the building. If done properly, the elevator strat is barely faster, however, it looks really cool, so that's why I do it. After hitting the elevator, we'll drop down a bit to meet up with the teammates running up the stairs, and we can even knife one if they get in the way. But we can only knife one though, because any more will fail the mission. Upon reaching Victor, we'll need to run right in front of him until he shoots himself, and then make our way back down to the building to hit the earlier checkpoints. But yeah, Victor shot himself to avoid revealing any information about his father. As Act 2 comes to a close, Gaz is disappointed, and says his son was our only lead sir. However, Price replies, forget it. I know the man. He won't let this go unanswered. Let's go. The start of Act 3 opens up with the mission ultimatum where Captain Price and his team have to knock out a power station in order to get to a launch facility with the help of Griggs, who was captured by ultranationalist forces. But honestly, they should have just let Griggs stay captured. First we'll strafe ahead past this jeep, and shoot the grenade launcher at this wall to alert some enemies, and then run back to the jeep, and wait for Price to kneel down before moving back up. This ensures that he and the rest of the teammates run forward instead of walk. We can then begin taking out the enemies in the trees as quickly as possible, and then wait by the door to enter the house. 
When Price opens this door, we'll kill this first guy and then aim our grenade launcher to fire on the left side of the door ahead of us to clear the enemies in the room. Then we'll run back down and pop some C4 out the window. We can also save a little bit of time here pushing Price closer to the door, saving a second or two. When Price says keep it quiet, that's our cue to do the exact opposite and detonate the C4 to spawn kill the enemies. Once we're inside the second house, we need to wait around a bit for the breach to start and we can wall bang the two enemies in the room in the meantime. We'll run behind Griggs to cut him loose and then run to the transmission tower. Next we'll plant some C4 on both legs of the tower and blow it up. The next section is mainly running, however we need to be cautious of explosive barrels. Price and Griggs will teleport as we exit the final building and we'll just want to clear out some of the remaining enemies to avoid them slowing down our allies. We can then head past this portion of the fence and do a full 180 and head back to these shipping containers to wait for the level to end. The reason we stand here is because if we're far away enough from the group, we can skip most of their dialogue. Meanwhile, Price meets up with a chief warrant officer named Smith and the ending sequence will play out. The team witnesses the launching of two missiles from the nuclear facility caused by Imran Zakayev as revenge for the death of his son. The missiles head towards the eastern United States with casualties projected to be approximately 40 million. During the next mission all in, the Special Air Service and USMC are in a joint operation to infiltrate the nuclear facility that Zikayev had just launched nuclear missiles from, in order to abort them. Base Command is working with the Russian loyalists to get the missile abort codes, while the Special Air Service and USMC ground teams attempt to enter the launch site where they enter the abort codes. There are two ways we can approach the start of this level, neither of which I do, but this is what they are. The super advanced and sketchy world record strat is to run straight into the base through this group of enemies and play some C4 to clear them all out. As you can see in Who's Run, he nearly dies trying to pull this off, which I'm assuming happens almost every time, but this makes us so our teammates still need to kill those enemies and can just run right through, which actually saves a ton of time. The other strat is to run left at the start of the level, jump on this rock, jump on a barrel, jump on another rock, and then jump over the fence. This only saves like 3 seconds, and I prefer not to risk any time loss at the end of the run, but that's just me. After reaching the staircase, we'll veer off to the left and shoot a nade, ideally clearing the pathway but we'll pick off stragglers if needed. It's really important to run through here quickly because we're still getting shot at from all angles. Next we'll need to take out two tanks as quickly as possible, and there are a handful of ways we can do this. I personally offer using the javelin for both, as it isn't time gated and is the most consistent, especially since I'm almost always red screened by the time I get up here. Other runners will throw a C4 at both tanks or shoot these red barrels that when exploded will destroy the right side tank, but you have to be pretty quick to make these strats worthwhile. After the tank is destroyed, we can head over to where our teammates are running out from and shoot towards their feet, which causes two of them to teleport to the vents, saving about 15 seconds. While waiting for the vents to be cut, we can head into this building and grab an RPD, which is really important because it will carry over to the next mission. At the vents, we just have to wait for our third teammate to catch up and then rappel down when the rope spawns, finishing the mission. In the mission No Fighting in the War Room, the soldiers successfully rappel down to the nuclear facility in order to abort the nuclear missiles. First we'll run up to Price and either shoot or throw a flashbang at him, which stops his path and allows us to push him out of the way in the vents rather than having to ride his ass the whole way through, saving about 15 seconds. While in these vents we can also wall run and do a cope strap by wall running on the right side of the vent just before we drop down. This is because after clearing the next section, Price will hold the door open for both Soap and Griggs. But for some reason Griggs can get stuck and Price will just be soft blocked holding the door open, effectively killing the run. Great game by the way. While running through the next area, the RPD that we got from the last level is highly useful here as it allows us to stun anyone we see to avoid getting meleeed, as melee hits and any explosives pretty much one shot our character. We basically want to fly through the section, so it's better to keep moving rather than have to stop and kill someone, unless they're actually blocking our path. After climbing down the stairs is a good spot to start shooting some nades. I like to clear out the first group with one, and then the massive group in the back I'll use two for, because I'd rather be safe than sorry. Trust me, it's worth it. As we approach this door, if Price and Griggs are the only two teammates that we can see on the minimap, then we haven't soft locked. There will be a bit of a cutscene here, so we'll take some time to reload our weapons and prepare for the next section. What I like to do here is place a C4 inside the room, and then when the first enemy runs past, shoot it to detonate it, shoot the guy to the right, shoot the others to the left as they come up the stairs, shoot a nade in this room killing three enemies, and then finish off the rest towards the bottom. I just love enemy sections with consistent spawns because I feel like I can strategize way better. Anyways, once everyone's dead, Price and Griggs will move up, and then we'll place the C4 on this wall. If it's not obvious, we do need to step back a little before detonating it so that we don't actually kill ourselves in the process. In the control room, we'll take down every enemy, and then enter the launch codes as quickly as possible. The next strat is the ultimate price strat, 
where we want to push him through the blown up wall in order to get him to move closer to the next area. However, we don't want him to go too far, so we sort of keep him trapped in the general area and can keep him at bay by shooting at his feet to change his direction. This price chat will cause the door to open a lot sooner, saving a bit of time. After killing enemies in this room, we'll enter this elevator and wait for the dialogue to play out. This last area can be extremely random as to where the enemies are located, and not only do they all have to die, enemies in last stand will count as being alive, so it's sometimes easy to forget about them. I like to keep a significant number of my grenade launcher shots for this area, as it's the best way to clear it quickly. As the mission fades as soon as the final enemy is killed, the team successfully aborts the nuclear missiles, leaving over 40 million people in the process. Imran Zakeyev is seen leaving in a helicopter, so now the final chase begins. And at last, it's the final mission, game over. Captain Price and his squad escape the nuclear facility and attempt to reach the evacuation site while dealing with an onslaught of ultra-naturalists. The team is split between two military vehicles as they speed down a set of roads. This entire sequence is essentially an auto-scroller, however it is still possible to die. We'll mainly want to focus on shooting the enemies with RPGs who have their heads sticking out of the jeeps before they even get the chance to fire them off, and clean up any enemies along the way. Eventually an RPG will spawn, and we'll pick it up to fire a few shots at the Soviet helicopter for bonus points, but it doesn't really matter if we hit it. The game will penalize us if we don't shoot it at all though, so yeah, we just can't forget to pick it up. The helicopter eventually destroys a bridge, preventing SOAP and the rest of the Special Air Service from escaping. During this section, we mainly just have to defend ourselves and not die. I actually found out the hard way that enemies can throw grenades over here, so the best spot to hide is behind Price, because he's basically invincible throughout the series anyways. There's no time saved during this section, we just have to wait the sequence out. Eventually the Ultra Nationalists corner the team on the broken bridge, however a fuel tanker behind them explodes, injuring everyone. As we wake up from the impact, Riggs is seen covering us, however he unfortunately takes a bullet to the head. As we continue to look around Daze, Captain Price is incapacitated, and Imran Zikayev, along with two Ultra Nationalist soldiers, move in to finish off Gaz and two other allies. As they move in to execute Soap, they're distracted by a Loyalist helicopter coming to the team's aid. Captain Price slides Soap a fully loaded pistol, allowing him a chance to shoot them. The crosshair will fade about 10 seconds after it appears, so we have this entire time to shoot them one by one, and then the speedrun ends on the first frame that the crosshair disappears. After killing Zakayev, the Loyalists rush Soap to safety, as a Russian medic is seen attempting to revive a seemingly unconscious Captain Price. As Soap is leveled up to the helicopter, he passes out, and a British newscaster is heard telling the world about the events in Russia, as well as the search of a cargo ship lost in the Bering Strait being called off. As a reminder, today's video is sponsored by Enlisted, so make sure you check out the link in the description to play Enlisted for free right now on PC, Xbox Series X, or PS5 to take advantage of the free bonus gift that comes with it. I also have to give a special thanks to Survivor, Who's, Blue Target, Kluger, and many others in the Call of Duty speedrunning community for giving me personalized coaching and helping out a ton with this video and the challenge. I ended up finishing the one week challenge with a one hour, 47 minute, and 13 second time. Even after the challenge ended, I was still trying really hard for a sub 145, but unfortunately, this game is just brutal when it comes to RNG, and after three additional days, I couldn't get a run where something catastrophic didn't happen. However, if you guys do want to see me get that sub 145, make sure you drop a like, as if this video gets 5k likes, I'll keep gunning for it. Anyways, that's all I have to say for today's video. Subscribe for more speedrunning content. And as always, I hope you all have a beautiful life.